necesitamos participar y escuchar, si podemos escuchar, en el idioma que prefiramos. Si ustedes quieren escuchar en español, pueden dirigirse a la mesa de registro, donde van a poder recibir este dispositivo para poder escuchar en español. Cuando lo tengan, por favor asegúrense de que esté en el canal 2 y cuando terminen de usarlo al final de la noche, por favor volteen la tapita atrás para quitarle la pila y devuélvanlo en la mesa de registro. Bueno, si tienen algún problema con el equipo, pueden ir a la mesa también para que les ayuden. Gracias. Good evening, my name is Maria Angelica, my pronouns are they and she, and today we'll be providing interpretation in Spanish with Marble Language Services to ensure that today we can participate and listen, if we're able to, in the language that we prefer. For folks who prefer to listen in Spanish, you may get one of these devices at the registration table where you'll be able to hear in Spanish in real time. Thank you very much. Gracias. Good evening. If you're following your agenda, uh, we would like to speak to you about preparations for the action. And I introduce my co-president, Reverend Bancroft William. We stand bold. We stand bold. We stand bold. My name is Bancroft Williams. I am the pastor, as you heard, from Merrill United Methodist Church in Lauderdale Lakes. We are here for the cause of justice tonight. We have serious community problems that need our attention. And we have community problems in Broad County with extreme heat. We are experiencing. We have serious problems with the rising cost of living, with our housing costs escalating, threatening to make living in South Florida unaffordable. We have serious problems with our criminal justice system that is flooded with thousands of people being arrested each year because they are simply too poor to pay fines and fees. We have serious problems, don't we? So what do we do? Nehemiah chapter 5 says that the people raised a great outcry against their fellow brothers and sisters who were oppressing them and making them poor. When Nehemiah heard that, the scripture says that he was very angry. Did you hear? Very angry. And he called the decision makers to account at a great assembly. Much like Nehemiah, we are angry. People are suffering. And tonight we have called a great assembly. For the serious community problems of cost of living for basic housing, the extreme heat, and people being arrested because they are poor, we have developed campaigns on each of these issues to focus the attention of our public officials and some of the right places. We live in a time and place where, when there are a lot of yelling and screaming by partisan politicians in different stripes. The conservatives say, we need to stop wasting taxpayer dollars, cut government spending, and be st strong on crime. The liberals say, but we need to invest in people spend money on programs and create more social support to prevent crime. Tonight, we say that spending is not really the point. It's not about spending more or cutting less. It's about spending money in the right places. And when we spend money in the wrong places, it actually costs us more. So what do I mean by this? Listen to me for a minute. Say, for example, you drive in and you get a ticket. Like 
for not completing a stop sign or, you know, or some other thing. And there's a fine that comes with it that's about $200. If you cannot afford to pay it, your driver's license will get suspended. Well, don't you have to go to work anyway? Right? So you keep driving. You get pulled over again and now you're driving on a suspended license. The fees for that can be as high as $1,016 in Broward County if you are arrested. Then you, have to, uh, then you have court fees along with the fees to reinstate your driver's license and that's assuming you don't lose your job in the middle of all of that while in jail making it harder for you to pay the fines. Now, on top of that, you have an arrest record. Guess what? It's expensive. Don't you think so? And it doesn't even include the cost of, to taxpayers who have to be paying more money to keep people in jail. This is what we call the criminalization of poverty. Being poor is not a crime. Being poor is not a crime. Being poor is not a crime. The issues that we address tonight, therefore, don't belong to one political party or one vested interest. The issues diverting nonviolent offenders from court systems and dealing with extreme heat in our community and making housing more affordable for everyone are not liberal nor conservative. These issues are not Christian, Jewish, or Muslim. These issues belong to all of us in this space. So just because these issues belong to all of us does not mean that they are not interest, entrenched interests rather that benefit from the status quo. Let me give you some examples. There are private groups like state radio station and crime stoppers that get paid when anybody gets arrested. Did you know that? The clerk of court's office is funded through fines and fees. Developers make more money by building high and expensive housing instead of building houses that people can afford. They make more money when they don't have to worry about including trees and green spaces in their construction. So, tonight, my friends, we have to be ready for our public officials and in subsequent meetings beyond tonight to resist any commitments to actions by using deflections or deceptions. So, for example, we are not expecting the sheriff here tonight. We have been working for months to get his commitment, and as of this morning, he had not committed to be here. We might send someone in his place. If someone does come in his place, we will recognize who they are. We'll be respectful. However, we cannot negotiate with them because the sheriff is the decision maker. And part of the reason we are still dealing with this issue with the, the, the version of arrest is because we accepted meetings with the sheriff's staff instead of the sheriff himself. And just in case the sheriff decides to show up tonight, let's talk what may happen. It might just be that we allow him to speak. But for us right now, we are looking forward. He may say, my general counsel is reviewing the letter, and I'll let you know. The problem is this or that, or the director of the highway safety and motor vehicle says, this is not so, but this same director in 2021, three years ago, did say that there is no problem in diverting arrests from a traffic offense. Three years. We have the letter. Three years. Don't you think three years is a long time? And every day that goes, more and more people get arrested when they don't need to be. So this is what we're going to be doing. Tonight, we're going to be working together as a team. We have a floor team that will help to direct us. We have, 
for those who are not standing on the floor team or what the floor team person so raise their hands and wave and shout out loud so they can see you shout out man I don't hear you floor team they have been trained they will lead our chairs they will tell us when to stop they will tell us when to go just follow those leaders they will, they will answer the questions you will have right beside you so don't be afraid to ask them almost anything. But there are certain, some things we need to keep in mind. First, listen to me. Don't boo any public officials. That's the first commandment. Don't boo any public official. You got that? Okay. Second, don't applaud them for just being here. All of these officials are accountable to us. To you and I in some fashion, they should be here. So when you see them, don't do a round of standing ovation. Don't do that. Second, the second commandment, don't applaud public officials. You got that? The third commandment, we applaud loudly when they make real commitments or actions. If they say yes, we make a loud applause. The fourth commandment. Don't applaud an official when they distract or deflect or try to push off answering something directly. For example, one of our officials might say, I agree with your concern, but... Did you hear that one? I agree with your concern, but... You really need to talk to the police chiefs. And when an official blames someone, they are trying to take the focus off themselves. And so, we want tonight to be focused on what we do. Tonight, we come to speak with one voice. One voice only. Tonight, we stand bold. We stand bold. We stand bold. We now officially call this meeting of bold justice, March 18th, 2024, to order. Are you introducing the agenda? Yeah. Who's going to get the first one? Okay, take the, that from the microphone. Okay. So we are waiting for our public officials. And, but in the meantime, we do the prayer. And so in the meantime, we'll be doing our prayer. Let me just say that tonight, Reverend William Knott was, is, is slated to have done the prayers, but unfortunately, he got ill. We need to remember him in our prayer. And so tonight, we're going to invite um, the Reverend Kevin Cumberbatch from New Jerusalem um, Baptist to come and just to bless us tonight. Let us pray. Father, we thank you on tonight for being in this gathering with these, your people. We ask, Lord, that as we reason together, you would pour into us as a people wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We thank you for this community that stands bold for justice. So let everything that will be done be done to honor, to glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good evening, Bull Justice. I'm Pastor David Raines from Miramar United Methodist Church, and I'm sharing with you the ground rules for tonight's meeting. We gather tonight with the spirit of the great leader 
Nehemiah on our minds and on our hearts. Nehemiah heard the cries of his people and was angered by the challenges facing his community. Tonight, we gather with our public officials. Welcome, just like Nehemiah. We are frustrated about injustices and the injustices facing our world. And we gather today to call upon our county leadership to make change and bring some relief to those who are suffering from these injustices. As pursuers of justice, we ourselves need to act justly. Our goal tonight is to unite more than 1,000 voices as one, and to do so, we have three ground rules for our meeting. First, there will be no questions from the floor. Tonight's meeting is the result of countless hours of research and planning to get to this point. We had meetings with each of the officials here tonight to discuss our findings and to hear their thoughts on them. And so tonight is about action. Our second ground rule is that we will treat our public officials and community leaders with respect. There will be no booing or name calling in this meeting. Even if we disagree with their statements, we will listen carefully and respond without personal attacks. The pursuit of justice is done justly. Third, we will expect respect in return from those same public officials. We have met with everyone and discussed our concerns, and tonight we are looking for direct and straightforward answers to these concerns, and we will press for these answers. And following these rules, our congregations can speak out with one voice and can show our public officials that we stand bold for justice. Amen. Tonight, we'll be speaking on three issues, extreme heat, housing, and ad an adult arrest, or civil citation, rather. So today, we're going to begin with the extreme heat we will invite Jean Anderson, my co-president, to come and to give us an update, and followed by a testimony by Joyce Kennedy, and Jean will take it on from there. This is the report for extreme heat from our committee. People of bold justice, did you find the heat unbearable last summer? Well, according to the meteorologists, it was the hottest summer we have ever had since the first time they began keeping records. And we knew because the people of Bold Justice spoke. We heard stories of hospitalizations from the heat, people who had difficulty breathing, abnormally high energy bills from the increased heat. I personally know people whose bills have increased. Maybe it's yours. I know people whose grandmothers and aunties were suffering in their homes because they couldn't afford to turn on the air conditioning. You know what made me angry? This is a major issue here in Broward County. So at Bold Justice, we started the Extreme Heat Committee to address this. Our research showed that it is 20 degrees cooler under a tree. So if we want to reduce heat, we need more trees. It should be a priority to create canopy here in Broward County. Did you know that Broward County has the lowest tree canopy in the state of Florida. It is currently only at 20%. Our solution was to get Broward County to fund free tree giveaways, targeting our communities that lack trees, targeting the communities where our congregations are. And we can show you the data on that. I now invite Joyce Kennedy, a member of Merrill United Methodist, 
to come forward. Joyce received free trees. Joyce? Good night, everyone. Thank you, Jean. I really want to tell you a lot about this need for trees in Broward. In the year 2017, Broward County endured a massive and dreadful hurricane. Hurricane Irma turned out to be a Category 4, and it really ravaged our county with winds well over 185 miles. The wind blew down huge canopy trees that really lined the fence of my backyard. In fact, I bought that house in 2016 because I love those canopy trees, and also not for the beauty, but for the shade it offered. Of course, I lost that in the hurricane. And since the loss of that tree, I have seen my energy bill go up from $85 per month to $152. Well, thanks to Bold Justice and their free tree giveaway, I now have a tambourine tree that will grow 60 feet tall. And yes, I got that tree free. I got it on December 9th from Merrill United Methodist Church. I learned that this wild tambourine tree is resistant to high winds. But if it does get blown down, it will grow, it will regrow. So that's a good thing. No, I don't have to worry about losing this nice wild tambourine tree, correct? I am really blessed and truly, truly, ultimately, now that not only do I have a full tree line around my property, they can, what we call a community. We have that again, and we will grow that tree. As you know, shade is extremely important. Last year, the temperatures soared, and many persons had to be rushed to the emergency room. Well, I know someone that happened to, and maybe you do as well. My friend, going home from shopping, waited at the bus stop. Next thing she knew, she was at the emergency room. She fainted. That high temperature actually knocked her down, and she fainted. Who wants to be in an emergency room after shopping? Now, that happened to several persons, as Jean said. It happened in Broward County. And so, if we really reduce the heat by the canopy trees, she wouldn't have fainted. Very likely, she would be home, well, with her family. So now all I can say is I am very grateful to Bull Justice. Not only did they recognize this issue, but together we found a solution for the issue, and that solution will now meet the needs of all of us. Meet the needs of my friend who fainted, for me, who now have the beauty, or in future, hopefully it grows, I live long enough to see it grow, and see my backyard beautiful again. Thanks to Bold Justice for this platform that I can share with you all the need to reduce heat in Broward County. Thank you, Joy. When we met with Anthony Gross, Senior Program Project Director, of the Resilient Environment Department, he told us that part of figuring out Broward's tree canopy and growing it is countering the loss of trees during hurricanes and storms. As you just heard, we have met that need with our free tree giveaways. By Joyce getting a healthy tree to replace the one that was knocked down, we have replenished canopy. And replenishing and creating canopy is key to reducing this extreme heat across Broward County. So far, 320 trees were given out. Yes, 320. <laughs> and I want to thank, a special thank you to each of you here tonight who received that tree, planted it, and is now caring for it 
to grow the canopy. Yes, you are a part of the impact on the canopy. We have planned a third free tree giveaway with the date to be determined right here at San Isidro Roman Catholic Church in North County. Applaud yourselves. I would now like to invite to the stage Anthony Gross, Resilient Environment Department. Can you take that lectern. That lectern with Pastor. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you hold it. Okay. Sorry, little details that work out. But one thing I'd like to correct on what Gene said is we haven't met the issue, we're meeting the issue. So we're meeting the issue together. So again, we appreciate this partnership with Bold Justice because it gives us, as I believe the next slide uh, indicated, it gives Naturescape the chance to bring the trees out to you, to the community. It also gives us the chance to get more trees to build our tree canopy, but also provides for uh, Bold Justice to meet your needs in terms of the heatscape and provide food. In addition, next slide please. Uh, as Gene said, we have three giveaways. We've already done two. That gives us certain level trees, but we're looking at uh, Jan May to be here uh, at this location. But what's really interesting is the next slide. On the January 27th, we were able to take zip codes. We weren't interested in your address. We were just looking at zip codes because I wanted to see how the trees were going to be dispersed through the county. So unfortunately, we didn't have December's data, but if you can imagine, that was up in Lauderdale Lakes, and we know that there was residents from as far away as Pompano and Coconut Creek who came down to Lauderdale Lakes to Merrill United Methodist for that tree giveaway. So if we could overlay these you know, addresses, you would see that we're actually distributing these trees throughout the entire county. Uh, so that's really great, and then hopefully in May we'll see. And the biggest issue is the partnership. And while we've committed to one more, again, I'm here to uh, reiterate to Gene and to Bold Justice that I'm open to continuing these through our 2024 and 2025 year. Uh, we can come up with new trees. It, we've right now been giving away uh, wild tamarind, gumbo limbos, uh, carambola, and mango. We can change that palette to offer different trees uh, again through the next year. But one real quick story that I wanted to say where Gene was saying how the temperature was reducing. I have another program that's called the Emerald Awards program, and I just know, uh, recognized a home down in Dania Beach, super hot, one block away is a Popeye's restaurant, surrounded by a community that has mature oak trees. That home, the difference in temperature underneath those oak trees is so much that that household's average electric bill is only $100 a month. So again, a testament to the fact that trees do reduce uh, heat and they, and they provide a cooler environment. Thank you, and I appreciate the partnership that we've had and look forward to working with you guys some more. Let's give a hand for Anthony Grove. Thank you, sir. Our next issue is housing, and I invite to the stage at this time Pastor Norman Freeman for a statement of the problem, and then testimony from Maria Alexander and Leo Smart. Good afternoon, or well, good evening. At the Community Problems Assembly in October, we voted in a cost of living as a new area for research and action. We had heard stories about the cost of groceries growing up, going up, stories about the cost of utilities, the cost of health care, and so on and so forth. But more than anything, we heard about the cost of housing. As we looked into this more, we found that the problem was worse than we anticipated. Broward County has the least affordable housing in the entire country. Let that sit in. While housing places like New York, Los Angeles, and even San Francisco cost more, salaries 
they are higher as well. In Broward, we have a combination of low salaries and high, 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 high housing costs, giving us the least affordable housing in the entire country. In 2016, a two-bedroom apartment would cost you $1,590 a month. Now that same apartment costs $2,693 a month, an increase of 70%. That means the majority of renters are considered cost burden. Just look at the numbers. In 2018, the median house price of a house in Broward was 350,000. Today, that same house will sell for over 600,000. This is an increase of 70%. This means 95% of the residents of Broward County cannot afford to buy a house here. Can y'all believe that? 95%. This is not simply an academic problem. It is impacting the lives of real people living right here in Broward County. I used to be a youth pastor, and the youth that I worked with, as they went off to college and some went to the military, most of them never came back. I would keep in touch with them, and they would end up in places like Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, North Carolina and South Carolina. And I was told over and over again that they were not coming back to this area because they could not find a place to live that was affordable. Plus, they were able to buy a house in those same cities where their money would go further for the square footage we offered in this area. Let's hear directly from someone who has been affected by this housing crisis. Good evening, Bold Justice. My name is Lisa Montalgi, and I attend Trinity Lutheran Church in Pembroke Pines. I moved to Pembroke Pines 20 plus years ago from New Jersey. I love everything about South Florida. I love the weather, I love the beaches, I love the friends I've made, my church family, and the work that I do for Bold Justice. My husband and I are renters, and we live on a fixed income. Last June, we were expecting a rent increase, as we usually get one every year. We were not expecting, however, a $600 increase. You heard that right, $600. In the past, we were able to negotiate the increase. Not this time. This time, we were literally told, pay it or move, non-negotiable. We looked at apartments for months, and anything affordable to us was either a teeny tiny studio or a horribly in uninhabitable mess. One apartment we looked at was condemned a week after we saw it. We decided since we had a roommate at the time and she agreed to pay an, in an increase as well, we signed for another year. Just a few months later, our roommate took a bad fall and wound up having to move out due to medical complications. So, for the past several months, we've been having to pay that $600 increase ourselves, which basically means living on credit cards. Um, it will be impossible to sustain another increase in this July. I fear that we will have no choice but to move out of the area, <clears throat> which absolutely breaks my heart. The cost of living is not going to get any better anytime soon. That's why we have to work on this issue, and it's so important, because it's unacceptable. That's why I stand bold for justice. Yeah. This crisis is so out of control that the county commission has just recently taken action 
On March 8th, the county passed a 10-year affordable housing master plan. The plan was developed in conjunction with Dr. Ned Murray from Florida International University, an expert on housing in South Florida. The 50-page plan recommends all 31 counties set up an affordable housing trust fund. Cities allow things like employer-assisted housing, houses with attached units for in-laws and other family. Allow developers to build more homes and rental units in an area in exchange for those units being affordably priced. More housing near public transit. Some of these efforts will be funded by the county using a property tax called TIF, T-I-F, for affordable housing. In 2025, that means an additional $9 million for affordable housing. The county is projecting that by the year 2032 would mean 72 million of additional money for affordable housing. Let's take a pause for a moment. This is an ambitious plan. This plan has a lot of great goals and ideas in it. And this plan does not require the county to do anything. Yes, you heard me. This plan does not require the county to do anything. As Commissioner Nan Rich said, there are no mandates here, and this plan is flexible and can be changed. The Broward 10-year housing master plan is an amazing start, but it is just that, a start. It's going to require groups like Bold Justice to follow up to make sure the plan is implemented and make sure that it's taken seriously. You can make the best plans in the world, but if you do not implement them, it will change nothing. So tonight, we want to celebrate the start of this amazing plan. It is a start in the right direction. But over the next several months, we will begin meeting with the decision makers in the county who are responsible for making sure that this plan is implemented, for making sure that something changes for housing affordability in Broward County. We will hold them accountable to their own plans and to their own ideals. Tonight is not the end of this campaign. It is only the beginning. I know we will persevere and win. And I know this because other groups have done the same thing. The BUILD organization in Lexington, Kentucky fought for years and finally won an affordable housing trust fund with $2 million a year placed in the budget. Then in year 2020, they got that expanded to $3 million a year. To date, over 3,000 families have been housed due to their efforts. In 2015, the PAC organization right next door in Miami they won an affordable housing trust fund. The first project built housing for seniors. In 2017, the FAST organization in Pinellas got the county to use 4% of their penny for Pinellas tax on affordable housing, which has generated over $20 million for affordable housing. Right here in Broward County, at Bold Justice, the very first issue we worked on was affordable housing. Now, I wasn't involved, I wasn't here yet, wasn't a part of Bold Justice at the time, but I've been told that when we conducted our research, we discovered that the county had developed a plan to expand affordable housing 
but was not funding it and was not implementing it. Bold Justice's first victory was holding the county accountable to following through with their plan that they wrote. And as a result, 2,422 new affordable housing units were created. Sounds a lot like the situation we found ourselves in right now, doesn't it? We know we can win on housing. We know we can hold the county accountable for implementing this new plan. We know it because we've done it before and we can do it again. So tonight is the first step we have a lot of work to do in the upcoming months. And if you're interested in being a part of the Housing Research Committee, speak with a team member who invited you tonight about how you can join us in this fight. We stand bold. Thank you, sir. We now take this pleasure to look at the adult arrest subcitation issue and, and to lead us off, we now invite to his own space, Father Wilfredo Contreras and his team. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there are now over 187,000 people with suspended licenses in Broward County. And we know that 77% of license suspensions in our county are given for unpaid fees and fines. That is more than three quarters of the suspensions. Often, these fees and fines go unpaid because the license holder cannot afford to pay them. And fines then go up unpaid. And then suddenly one gets arrested, even for a misdemeanor. It adds even more to the cost that people couldn't pay in the first place. For the first offense of driving on a suspended license, one might have to pay as much as 1,016 whopping dollars. If one happens to also be undocumented, now one runs the risk of being deported, leaving their children behind, and in effect, ripping families apart. And that is evil. That is evil. This is the criminalization of poverty. What many people don't know is that our court system is entirely funded by these costs. Did you know that? While fines are intended to be a punishment, fees are simply assessed to raise revenue. And many unrelated trust funds, such as the state radio program, are funded through these fees. Even a private nonprofit organization called Crime Stoppers funds its budget with fees from people who are arrested. The court system is set up in such a way that the, its budget is fully funded when more and more people are arrested, and that's just wrong. We do not believe that people should be criminalized because they are poor. Being poor is not a crime, my family. It is not a crime. That's why the Adult Civil Citation Program is so important. Civil citations give people consequences without branding them for life with a criminal record. Those who qualify for a civil citation often have to do community service hours or take classes, but they don't end up with an arrest record which prevents them from getting jobs, housing, or puts them at risk for deportation. Adult civil citation makes for good policy. Every civil citation saves $4,500. That's $4,500 for case. And they are more effective 
and only, with only 4% of people who get a civil citation get rearrested. 4%. And then we have counties like Pinellas County have seen how effective this program is, and they get more than 1,000 adults into the civil citation program every year. But in 2023, BSO, Broward Sheriff's Office, only gave out, want to know how many? 63. The civil citation program is not being used to its full potential, especially when it comes to driving offenses. Let's hear from Maria, who has a personal experience with this problem. Maria? Thank you, Father Ricardo. Thank you, Father Ricardo. Good evening. My name is Maria Alexander. My cousin, Maria Severus, was driving her mother's car on her way home from work. The police pulled her over. The officer asked Maria for her driver's license. She was told that her driver's license was suspended. She was taken, she was um, handcuffed and taken, I'm sorry. The, she was handcuffed and arrested. Maria originally is from Peru. She was in the process of getting her legal residency, but it had not come yet. So the officer called ICE. She was taken into custody to Pampano Beach. She was there two weeks. She, it's a sad story, my, my cousin. Then she, they wanted to deport her. An arrest can make getting your legal residency nearly impossible. So Maria's family hired a lawyer to fight with, which cost a lot of money and put a, a strain on our family. Unfortunately, Maria passed away in an accident before the court made a final decision about her fate. But the entire situation was very difficult for her and our family. It is unjust they did this to my cousin. The sheriff needs to change this unjust policy. We stand bold justice. Bold justice. Thank, thank you, Maria. Unfortunately, Maria's cousin and stories like hers are very, very common. People across our country are being saddled with lifetime arrest records for these minor infractions. A team of bold justice leaders met with the Miramar city manager, Dr. Roy Virgin, and some of his staff in February. Miramar gives out more adult civil citations than any other city in Broward County. Because of their commitment, yeah, that's something to be grateful for. Because of their commitment to the civil citation program, we thought that that might be an opening to include misdemeanor driving offenses as well. So during the meeting, we spoke with Dr. Virgin and his staff about the problem and our proposed solution. They listened and then Dr. Virgin committed to include driving offenses as eligible for civil citations. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So this is a very important step forward for the community. And so at this time, I would like to invite Dr. Virgin to tell us about Miramar's new policy 
when it will begin, and why it's important to be a leader on this issue in Broward County. Dr. Virgin? Good evening. Um, my name is Roy Virgin. As, spoke, as I said before, I'm the city manager for the city of Miramar. And uh, I want to first take this opportunity to express our appreciation for you inviting us. Before I say anything further, um, just to show our commitment to the civil citation program, I have with us our chief of police, Delrish Marsh. Could you stand, please? <laughs> Can you, come, can you come up here? And, can you come, Mr. Moss? And further, I have his boss here with me, Assistant City Manager um, Adam Burton, who's in charge of public safety. Very welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. So you see, I come well prepared so that I can be defended. <laughs> no, the Miramar Adult Civil Citation Program, as I spoken earlier, we, in 2022, we had 22 arrests, 22 citations, sorry. And in 2023, we doubled that by 250%. That was 98 civil citations, adult civil citations handed out. That is to show our commitment towards this cause. And during that meeting, we ensure that we will do whatever it takes, because you know, Miramar is one of the leading cities in Broward County, to make sure that Things like adult civil citation will help to mitigate some of the factors that are caused through an arrest for simple stuff, a broken tail light or any other stuff. And so in our policy, we have come up with those areas in which we can have those citations that will indeed limit an arrest or reduce it where is necessary. So our policy will become effective uh, we are, we, we're in consultation with Broward County, and as soon as they give us the okay, the policy will be in effect. Um, so we want to make sure, and we want to say this loud and clear, that we invite other cities in Broward County to join us yes. in this cause yes. so that we can have reduced arrests, yes. reduced arrests and more civil citation that will make it better for our young people particularly. Yes. So once again, I want to thank you for your invitation, and we look forward to working with Bowl Justice. Thank you. Dr. Virgin, uh, Mr. Chief of Police, and Mr. City Manager, thank you once again, and thank you for your commitments. This is exactly what we're looking for but for this part, all of the county, that's exactly what we want. So we will be reaching out to your office uh, in the next couple of weeks, Dr. Virgin, in order to set up a follow-up meeting to go over the details of the new policy. We also held a meeting with the chief of police of Fort Plantation. And that meeting also was very encouraging. And we will be meeting with him again in a couple of months to follow up. Brother Campbell. Now it's time for us to talk about BSO. <laughs> Sheriff Tony attended the Bold Justice Nehemiah action last year, right here in San Isidro Catholic Church. I was the spokesperson that evening for Pastor Rose, Pastor Reigns, Pastor Refredo, Gene Anderson, and several others were on the stage as well. Our team asked Sheriff Tony to make driving offenses eligible for a civil citation. I want to show you all a clip of our conversation with Sheriff Tony to remind you what he said. What are, the question that we're asking, we're trying to, to make sure instead of arresting those individuals and having them to go to jail and then having to release them, sure. we're trying to eliminate them being taken to jail and having the first round. And having, especially if they're eligible for an adult civil citation. So again, what we're asking is, is that if you will, 
include misdemeanor driving offense. We're not talking about felony you know, uh, of, of driving offenses, but the things that we mentioned. We're asking it that if you would include those things and make those problems, those issues, those misdemeanor offenses eligible for civil citation for adults. That's all we're asking. If we can, yes. There, there are certain things that have to be talked to legal about because we don't manage all the public safety patrol for every city in Broward County. There's about 12 other police chiefs that have some inclusion in that. Okay. It's not a complicated request. We just might, gotta make sure we can legally do it right. Okay. We've looked at, uh, we have a letter actually from the director, uh, Director Rose, stating that it is a local decision, as you mentioned, and we're asking you to make that decision. What we're asking is we know that there are other police agencies in the county, but with BSO having the largest juris jurisdiction, we're asking that if BSO would take the lead in starting this. Okay, that's more specific. Yes. All right. I can, I can handle BSO and make sure we're doing it. That is a yes. We got the tape. Let's break well, down. The question that we're asking, we're trying to, to make just... sure, <laughs> instead of arresting those individuals, there we go. Now let's just break down what the sheriff said. We asked him, will you make misdemeanor driving offenses eligible for civil citations? We clarified that we are not talking about felonies, but only misdemeanors. Sheriff Tony says that he has to make sure it is legal. I believe his exact words were, it is not a complicated request. We just have to make sure we speak to legal and do it right. It is not a complicated request. It is completely reasonable to want to make sure everything is legal. So we let Sheriff Tony know that we have a letter from the director of the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles that says this is legal. See the letter here is on the screen. We also clarified that we are only talking about BSO's district and at that point, Sheriff Tony said, yes, that is more specific. I can handle BSO and make sure we are doing this. Let me just repeat what Sheriff Tony said one more time. It's not a complicated request. Yes, I can handle BSO and make sure we are doing this. This was exciting, wasn't it? How many of y'all remember that? That was exciting to hear him, him give that yes. I know it left me excited. In October, he sent us a training bulletin that clearly stated that driving offenses are now eligible for civil citations. If you look on the screen, you'll see the training tab that he issued showing us that driving offenses are now eligible for civil citations. One of his colonels attended our community problems assembly in October. At the assembly, we celebrated him and Sheriff Tony for the work they were doing to end the criminalization of poverty. They had a new policy in place that said they would give civil citations for low level driving offenses. Bo Justice, on February 21st, we had a meeting with one of the Sheriff, Sheriff Tony's captains in order to look over the data on how the new policy was going. And we were shocked to find out that they are not giving civil citations for driving offenses. Not a single one in four months, zero. Let that sink in. Well, this has to be some kind of mistake, right? I mean, Sheriff Tony made a commitment. He said it wasn't complicated. 
He said he would handle BSO. But as it turns out, it was not a mistake. During the meeting with BSO, the captain told us that what the sheriff sent was not a policy. And in fact, the actual policy specifically says not give civil citation for driving offenses. The exact opposite of what the sheriff has been telling us for close to a year now. Why didn't we know about this? Because in order to see the policy, you have to do a public records request. The captain showed it to us in the meeting, but would not let us take it with us. So the sheriff had one policy that is shown to the public and another policy that is kept hidden that you can only see if you know just who to ask. Well, we did the public records request, and we have the policy now on the screen. Let me tell you something. The sheriff lied to us, lied to us, and thought we would never figure it out. I'm angry. All of us on this stage are angry. We have been fooled, so who's to blame for this? The sheriff's staff claims that they had the best intentions, that when they sent the policy to the general counsel, they were told you can't do this because it violates policies of the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles, but that simply is not true. We know it's not true because the director of the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles has already said it is perfectly legal to give civil citations for driving offenses. We have a letter signed from, by the former director dated May 28, 2021, almost three full years ago. And as you saw on the clip, we told Sheriff Tony about this last year at this very meeting. That letter is part of the reason he was able to say yes. It is simply not believable that BSO did not have the information necessary to make this decision. This continued delay is ridiculous, and it has to stop. You know, Bull, Bull Justice, maybe we can clear this up right now. Sheriff Tony was invited to be here tonight we invited him by letter. We made dozens of phone calls. A group of 20 of us even showed up at his office, inviting him to meet with us in person. I don't know if he's somewhere in the audience, but Sheriff Tony, are you here tonight? Has anyone seen Sheriff Tony? Looks like he's not here tonight. Now, if this was a simple misunderstanding, you would think that the sheriff would be here to resolve this problem immediately. But as you can see, our sheriff is not here. He is not here tonight, and he is not offered to meet with any of us either, despite our many requests. So people like Maria will continue to be needlessly arrested. 
Between October and December of last year, BSO arrested 75 persons for minor driving offenses. And most of these individuals would have been eligible for a civil citation if Sheriff Tony had implemented this policy. Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. To this point, Sheriff Tony has not acted with integrity. To this point, he has disrespected our community. He has allowed more and more people, our brothers and sisters, to get lifetime arrest record. And we believe that this is the very definition of evil. If, if, if Sheriff Tony wants to regain the respect of our community, he needs to meet with us and resolve this issue immediately. However, as of right now, we don't have a meeting. This afternoon, Brother Campbell and others reached out to his office again, spoke with one of his assistants who said that she would ask Colonel Holmes to take charge of this matter. Brother Campbell clarified that the meeting needed to be with the sheriff because he is the decision maker. But as of now, we do not have a meeting. So, bold justice, we find ourselves in a very difficult situation. And in times like these, I remember the words of my grandmother who said, Son, you got to take everything to the Lord in prayer. And so, bold justice, we're going to turn to prayer. In three days, mark your calendar, Thursday, March 21st, we're going to have an old-time, old-fashioned prayer rally. Prayer rally. Do I have any prayer warriors in the house? We'll be coming together at Grace Alone Lutheran at 10.15 in the morning, 10.15 a.m., and then we'll head on over to the sheriff's office. He's got a pretty large courtyard there. Can house about 100 people. We're going there to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for the people and the families who are being hurt. We're going to pray. We're going to pray because our sheriff continues to needlessly saddle people with lifetime criminal records. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for the families that are being ripped apart because a loved one was deported instead of given a civil citation. We're going to pray. And as people of faith, we're going to even pray for Sheriff Tony. We're going to pray that the sheriff hears our cries. We're going to pray that he decides to, to meet with us and put an end to the criminalization of poverty. And so Thursday, March 21st, as Grandma said, you got to take some things to the Lord in prayer. We're going to pray for the very soul of our county. If we're going to be successful, we need people of faith to be praying. As I mentioned earlier, he's got a large courtyard there. Can hold at least 100 people. And so we're going to ask you, I know some of you will be working. Right in your agenda packet on page 7, there's a sign-up sheet there. We ask you right now, let me give you just a minute. 
If you don't have a pen, ensure that your neighbor has a pen to your left or to your right. Or I'll give you just a minute to, to, to write your name, your congregation, your phone number so we can contact you so that we can meet in prayer. Because as you're doing that right now, right now as you're doing that, we know as people of faith that prayer changes things. Prayer changes circumstances. Prayer changes minds. Prayer is powerful and there is nothing more powerful in this world than people of faith praying together. Now, I'm going to be there. I'm going to lead by example. I'm going to be there. And so let me do a quick poll right here, a quick ask. Brother Campbell, are you going to be there? I'll be there. Brother Campbell is going to be there. Father Wilfredo, are you going to be there? I'm going to pray there. He's going to be there and he'll be praying. <laughs> Reverend Anderson, are you going to be there? He's going to be there. there. I believe that when people of faith get together to pray, things will happen. I want at least a hundred persons there for us to stand bold for justice. We will now call for a summary of results and next steps from Father Fenley St. John. Father Fenley. Good evening, Bull Justice. Tonight, we all have made history. A one, a thousand people have come here tonight to fight for justice. And you all were a part of that, and this is a historic night in Ward County. Tonight, we fought for justice. Justice for all those caught in the criminal justice system. Justice for those suffering due to the extreme heat in our county. Tonight, we made progress on these critical issues, but the work does not end here. What happened next? We have three issue committees this night. Heat, housing, and adult arrest. The heat and housing committees are giving reports. The only real ambiguity is a one adult arrest. We are very disappointed tonight. Sherry Tony did not come. Every year, thousands of people in Broward County are branded for life as criminals. And the fact that he continued to ignore this problem is unacceptable. So join us for the prayer rally this Thursday, March 21st. And remember, we will meet at 1015 at Grace Elon Lutheran Church and then couple over to the sheriff's office and have the prayer rally in the county at out of front. And if you have not signed up, please do so now. We need at least 100 people to attend. The more of us that attend, the more power we'll have to force him to listen. Tonight, 
we could have taken steps to end this, to end the criminalization of poverty, but he did not even show up for the meeting. Remember as well to call his office tomorrow and express our disappointment that he was not here tonight. And what will happen next? Next week, all of our officials will be sent letters detailing what they agreed to tonight. The issue committees will be following it up with our officials, tracking the progress they are making on these commitments. And on May 14, Bold Justice will hold its annual Justice Ministry celebration. And that night, leaders from both committees will report on the progress made on these issues. All of the network members here tonight should plan on being in attendance that night. And as I told you earlier, tonight, you have all made history. And most importantly, you stand bold for justice. You stand bold for a great cause. You participate in changing life for others, changing life for people in our neighborhoods, changing life for people in our communities, changing life for people in our county. You participate in changing life for people who perhaps does not even know or care about who we are or what we do. And we take step beyond ourselves. We show care and love as we fight for a just society. And God is proud of us tonight. God is proud to see his children responding to his call to love one another. And this is what God does. This is who God is. God is love. God is mercy. And God is just. And tonight, we do God's works. We do heavenly work. And tonight, we bring a taste of heaven to many. And that is great and rewarding work. And let us go out of this place tonight, more energized than ever, fighting for what is just. And together, we stand bold. Merci bien, Father Fenley. Merci bien. Um, so, well, Justice, we have heard a lot, a lot to digest, a lot to do. Let me just remind us, this Thursday, the 21st, 10.15 a.m., Grace Alone, we meet to go and do what? Pray. To do what? Pray. All right. I just want to, and if you still have your sheets like me up here, Give them to the folks standing, the team, and the staff members. Just give it to them. They are right around there. So, and if you don't have a pen, we can give you one later. You still could write. Amen? All right. So we have that. So now we, and then for the, and for the evaluation team, remember we meet at the back after, the, after this meeting in the clear room. There's a clear room on the back, right? So we meet around there. So now let me invite Reverend Michael Anderson to come and to close us off in prayer. Let's prepare our hearts to pray. Will you chant with me? Bless my brother. That was weak. Bless my brother. That was better. Bless my sister. Bless my, Bless my neighbor. Let's try it again. Bless my brother. Bless my, Bless my, sister. Bless my sister. Bless my neighbor. Bless my neighbor. When we pray, and we pray only for ourselves, that's a good thing. But when we pray beyond ourselves, we can ensure that God will get involved. God loves answering the intercessor's prayer. So we thank you all for standing in the gap. So will you pray with me? I, Heavenly Father, we come, Lord God, and I thank you for covering this house. I thank you for covering this community. I thank you for covering these justice workers. You said that the hearts of the kings are in your hands, and you turn them every which way. 
You told us that we don't need to close our eyes, but we ought to watch and pray. That's what happened tonight. Bold justice is watching. <laughs> That's why we're praying. We're standing in the gap, Heavenly Father. We're asking now that you would help us make this county a more just county. Thank you for giving us the grace. Thank you for giving us the strength. Thank you for giving us the clarity. Paul said that you are the God of all comfort. And we thank you. That not only you're the God of all comfort, you're the God of all clarity. You help us to see better. Not only are you the God of all clarity, that you are the God of all conviction. When we try to go wrong, you convict our hearts and cause us to do those things which are right. But not only are you the God of conviction, you're the God of correction. That once, God, we find clarity, once, God, we find conviction, there it is. We have the responsibility to bring forth correction. So we stand together tonight for our brother, for our sister, for our neighbor, for our community. We stand together, bold, in the strong and mighty name of him who they killed but refuse to stay dead. We bless you now. Amen. Amen. God bless your heart. Go with God. Thank you. We now officially close this meeting of Bold Justice for our Nehemiah Action 2024. Thank you and good night. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Jimmy. I got my first Only boo-boo, only boo-boo.